Hey there, thank you for joining me for another devotional. Um, this week's devotional is going to be a bit different. Normally I've been sharing uh, some thoughts from some excerpts from email devotionals that I get. So um, they've all been books about the Christian life. Some of them are very devotional focused. Some of them um, are still about Christianity and living that out, but they're not necessarily devotional in nature. Uh, this one's going to be very different because the the quote that I'm going to be using isn't from a devotional book at all. Um, it's actually not from a, a book that would call itself Christian or and probably 95% of the book doesn't deal with Christianity at all. Um, but the excerpt that I'm going to use is very clear uh, just how much it speaks to the Christian faith. Uh, the book is open, uh, the Andre Agassi autobiography. And um, I remember when I was a kid rooting for Andre Agassi, we would watch the Grand Slams in tennis, and Andre Agassi seemed like a great guy. He was very workman. Um, the way that Andre Agassi's matches would go is um, Agassi pretty much stood near the middle of the court and just kept knocking the ball from one side to the other, and uh, you know he didn't do the ridiculous, the spectacular, but he just controlled things. It was very kind of down-to-earth play. And I remember when this book came out, uh, some of the controversy around it, because Agassi, um, the, the biggest controversy is that at one point in his career, Agassi dabbled in crystal meth use. Um, he ended up almost getting a suspension from the um, Association of Tennis Professionals, the ATP. Um, and um, he failed one drug test from it, and uh, there was this huge scandal that, oh, Agassi needs to forfeit, you know, some of his winnings, he needs to forfeit uh, some of the titles that he won because of, of doing this. When you read the book um, with what Agassi admits to, it doesn't quite seem like that. I mean, he admits to using the drug. He admits that, um, I don't even think he won anything around the time he was using this drug. Um, but um, he, he did lie to the Association of Tennis Professionals for it. Um, so, you know, that's that's not a positive. I'm not saying that's a great thing, um, but Agassi is very open about that in his book, which makes sense. That's the title of the book. Um, but um, the other thing that he's really open about that, I'm sure it would cause a lot of controversy. Is you would think Andre Agassi, one of a few players to complete what's called the Grand Slam. So he won all four major tournaments. Um, he is one of even fewer players to complete a Grand Slam and win a gold medal at the Olympics. Um, and so he, I mean, he's in this really small group. He, he didn't constantly win these major tournaments. He didn't constantly dominate in these different areas, but he has completed something that so few other tennis players did. Um, the, the number of tournaments he won, the number of matches he won, the, the number of times he uh, made it to the semifinals or the finals. I mean, he was just a very good and consistent player for a long time. And he admits and says it many times throughout the book, he hated tennis. He could not stand playing tennis. Um, it, it took him pretty much his whole life to get to a point where he could willingly go out and play the game of tennis. Um, it, he hated every bit of it because his dad made him play tennis. And Andre Agassi doesn't use these words, but from what he describes, his dad was verbally and emotionally abusive. His dad would yell, scream, curse at him for making the smallest mistake, never complimented him, never did anything positive for him whatsoever. And eventually, because his dad kept doing this stuff, he internalized it. So any time he would lose, any time he would hit a shot wrong, and any time something went the slightest bit wrong, he had internalized this voice constantly yelling at him, pressuring him, beating him up, and it took him most of his life to be, really deal with it. For, for most of his life, this 
internal destruction of himself uh, ruined him. It made it almost impossible for him to play tennis well. As soon as something would go wrong, he would fall apart. Um, it ruined relationships. Um, it, it, it caused him to be way too inward and to lie to himself and other people. And I couldn't help but thinking that so many of us have that voice in our head. It says that we're not good enough about something. We aren't good enough at the job that we do. We're not good enough at being a friend to someone else. We're, we're not good enough being a spouse, being a parent, being a grandparent. We're not good enough as a Christian. I think a lot of times we use that voice in our head and we attribute it to God. In fact, there is a book that has been written about how to not be a disappointment to God. Um, well, in Andre Agassi's book, he references to his Christian faith a, a couple times. It's not at all preachy. It, it barely makes reference to the fact that he's a Christian, but he does become really good friends with a pastor and Christian songwriter uh, that he continually calls JP throughout the book. And he ends up having a conversation with a JP in the book that speaks directly to this, this this voice inside our head that constantly says that we are just not good enough, that tears us down, that fuels our anger and rage toward other people. Um, Andre Agassi ends up taking JP on a drive, and uh, these are Andre Agassi's words describing this conversation he has with the pastor JP. I talk about my father. I tell JP about the yelling, the pressure, the rage, the abandonment. JP gets a funny look on his face. You do realize, don't you, that God isn't anything like your father. You know that, don't you? I almost drive the Corvette onto the shoulder. God, he says, is the opposite of your father. God isn't mad at you all the time. God isn't yelling in your ear, harping on your imperfections. That voice you hear all the time, that angry voice, that's not God. That's still your father. I turn to him. Do me a favor. Say that again. He does, word for word. Say it once more. He does. That, that voice in our head that tears us down time and time again, that's not God's voice. And, and Andre Agassi needed JP to, to repeat this to him so that it, it continued to, to wash over him. And I think a lot of us need that. that the reminder that, that when God looks at us, he calls us his beloved child. God, God looks at us and doesn't see all of our failures and all of our mistakes. God doesn't just, just look at us wondering, why on earth do we have to keep messing things up time and time again? God, God looks at us with, with love and, and with affection. And, and that voice that we have in our head tearing ourselves down, it's not God's voice. That Maybe it's our own voice. Maybe it's the voice of, of, of a parent or a relative. Maybe it's a voice of, of a teacher or a coach that we had in our childhood. It's, it's not God's voice. God's voice that speaks to us repeats the words that the Father said to Jesus at Jesus' baptism. You are my Beloved child, I'm pleased with you. I'm, I'm proud of you. You are the child I love so much. That's what God has to say to us. That's what God has to say to you today. Whatever stuff is going on in your life right now, however 
far you feel like you're falling short. The words that JP said to Andre Agassi are the words that I have to say to you that I think God has to say to you. That voice telling you how short you fall is not God's voice. God's voice says he loves you, he cares for you, he is pleased with you, he is proud of you. God bless you guys. Have a great day.